Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to the 17th annual Justice John Paul Stevens Awards Ceremony, Awards Luncheon. Um, my name is Dan Coton. I am this year's president of the Chicago Bar Association, and along with Chuck Smith, who is this year's president of the Chicago Bar Foundation, thank you for joining us here today. We have a record turnout, 450 plus people, for an event which I think over the past 17 years really has become uh, a tradition at the Chicago Bar. And uh, it seems that every year it continues to be a highlight of the bar year. And so thank you all so very much for being here. And now let me turn the dais over to Chuck Smith, who will share a brief history of this wonderful event. Thank you, Dan. First of all, on behalf of the Chicago Bar Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to the lunch. Um, the Bar Foundation is the charitable arm of the Chicago Bar Association, and so we are intertwined partners in furthering the interests of the, of the bench and bar in Chicago. Um, and we'll talk a bit at the end here about the CBF, if you will indulge me, but just a bit. Because this, this is about the Stevens Award, and, and when I look at the list of past recipients, I think the Stevens Award is really the Hall of Fame of Chicago lawyers. And, and when I researched the history of it, and Bob Glaze at the CBF helped me with this, um, it made a lot of sense. This award was founded by Justice Stevens' law clerk 17 years ago, uh, along with the CBA and the CBF as a tribute to the justice, but the way to be a tribute to this justice who was so important to the bar in the city of Chicago before he went on to the Seventh Circuit and the Supreme Court was to honor attorneys who best exemplify Justice Stevens' commitment to integrity and to public service in the practice of law. Um, so for the last 17 years, we've had a wonderful list of people who are in your program, and the folks who are in front of you today are worthy additions to that incredible group. Um, just a second about the Chicago Bar Foundation. You have some information at your tables about the CBF, but the CBF is committed to carrying on Justice Stevens' commitment to the noblest traditions of our profession, and in particular, in using our abilities as lawyers to help those less fortunate. Um, that is what the CBF is about. The CBF gives money through in grants to public interest organizations throughout Chicago. It gives free pro bono and uh, free assistance on public interest, on board development, on a number of other fronts, has developed uh, projects like the Justice Entrepreneurs Project and others, innovative projects that are being copied around the country. And all of that is done through the support of people like you in this room. And I, and I hope that um, over the next year of my term as president, you will consider supporting the Bar Foundation in the great work that it does around the city. Um, circling back to Justice Stevens, his pro bono and public service in his career as a practicing lawyer and as a judge is a great inspiration to all of us in this room, all of us in the legal community, as we step up in leadership to fill our nation's fundamental principle of equal access to justice for all. Um, thank you again for all of your support of the CBA and the CBF. I stand between some of you and lunch, so I'm going to keep it brief. But if any of you have questions about the Chicago Bar Foundation, please feel free to talk to me afterwards or to shoot me an email or give me a call. I'm happy to talk to anybody about why you should support the organization. And congratulations again to all the award winners. Okay, folks, we're going, to, uh, we're going to get started with our program now in the interest of time. I think, I think everybody's been, been served their meals at least, but please feel free to keep eating and enjoy your lunch. But uh, we're going to get uh, started with our program largely because of the fact that we have nine recipients this year and, uh, and Justice Stevens has to, has to get out of town. Um, all of our award recipients this year and for the past couple of years um, rather than stepping up and, and giving their acceptance remarks live in front of uh, all of us, have done brief videos um, accepting their awards. So you're going you're gonna to see those videos. And uh, in the interest of time, I think what I'll do is uh, a brief introduction of the first four recipients. And you'll see their videos. And then we're going to ask them to come up and take a picture with Justice Stevens. 
and then they'll sit and we'll do the remaining five recipients. Um, and so that's the sequence of how we're going to go about this. Um, my introductions are very, very brief. Just a few lines about each person. I think all of you have programs on your, ta on your seats which have the full biographies and explanations of each of the recipients and explaining why each and every one of them are so deserving. Um, but all I can say is that as we go through these nine individuals, keep in mind that when selecting our awardees, the Stevens Committee seeks lawyers who best exemplify Justice Stevens' commitment to public service and integrity during the course of their practices of law. Um, and one final note. I'm going to be introducing these awardees in alphabetical order, so there's no other reason for the sequence here. This is purely alphabetical. And for that reason, George Collins is first. Okay. All right. George, George Collins has been practicing law for 60 years now. And I think it's fair to say that he truly is a lawyer's lawyer who has developed his fine reputation largely through representing lawyers and judges in various disciplinary matters. I was uh, fortunate enough to handle a case on the opposite sides of George about a dozen years ago, and it was uh, one of the great experiences of my career because I learned an awful lot from him, not only as a lawyer, but in terms of being a true professional. And so, George Collins. Greatness is rare. One can live a long time and not be confronted with greatness. We look at the life of John Paul Stevens, and there are many great events of greatness which everyone knows about, but I'm going to tell you about one that you don't know about. When John Paul Stevens was a lawyer in a new partnership, he hired an associate. He and the associate worked together frequently on major cases, and then Justice Stevens went on to the Seventh Circuit. The lawyer remained in the practice. After many years, I met this young lawyer. He became involved in a case where he was a respondent at the ARDC. These are very nervous, difficult times for a lawyer. And one of the main points that we make is that the respondent is of good character. I asked him if he had any character witnesses that could help us, and he mentioned John Paul Stevens. On the day of the hearing at the ARDC, I called my first character witness, John Paul Stevens. He took the stand and for 20 minutes he explained the life and the history of the respondent, his good character, his benefits to society. The case concluded Judge Stevens, Justice Stevens, left the stand and walked out into the lobby of the ARDC. And the hearing board, three members, rose and came out and shook his hand. The result was an acquittal. I saw greatness. I saw a man who would reach back and help someone from many years ago who needed that help. That is greatness. And I was honored to be there. Thank you. Judge Brian Crow has served in virtually all sectors of our legal system. He was a judge in the Circuit Court of Cook County for a dozen years. He served as Corporation Counsel for the City of Chicago under Mayor Daley. And before and after those careers, he also had a vibrant and thriving practice in the private sector. Uh, truly deserving of the John Paul Stevens Award, Judge Brian Crow. I have uh, always admired uh, Justice John Paul Stevens for his commitment to public service. I have lived my life as seeking to achieve the goals he espouses uh, in that, that I recognize the need and the value of public service. I began as a public defender and then served as a judge for a long time. Uh, I was the city's corporation and counsel uh, and when I practiced law in the private uh, uh, sector, I served on the police board and a zoning board of appeals. Throughout my, my time in the practice of law, I, I, have, learned, I have learned that, uh, that being a lawyer uh, is more than 
than uh, applying a, a case law to a, a given set of facts or being able to, to argue a position before uh, a finder of fact. Instead, being uh, a, a lawyer is an obligation to serve the, the public and seek uh, justice in whatever small way we can. Therefore, I urge each of you to go out there and seek justice. Thank you to the uh, Chicago Bar Association for bestowing this honor uh, upon me. It is one I will always cherish. Uh, Tom Demetrio is a founding partner of the firm of Corboy and Demetrio here in Chicago. He is a nationally renowned trial lawyer. He is uh, my former boss and still very much my mentor. Tom is a former president of the Chicago Bar Association. He has been recognized by countless organizations throughout the country over the course of his career, and he truly is the quintessential recipient of the John Paul Stevens Award. Tom Demetrio. I sincerely thank the selection committee for this meaningful acknowledgement, which is intended to recognize CBA members for their public service and integrity. It is aptly named in honor of a great man who has always been a champion of both and a longtime friend of the CBA. I first learned the importance of public service through osmosis by being just around Phil Corboy, who was one of the first recipients of this award, as was everybody's pal and tomorrow's birthday boy, Bill Bauer. When I first met Corboy in 1972, he was president of the Chicago Bar Association. However, it was Justice Stevens who was slated to be president of the CBA at that time. But due to the sound judgment of President Richard Nixon, he was instead on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. Both today's and the past recipients of this award, all of whom I applaud, are merely cogs in a much greater wheel. For instance, the Lawyers Lend a Hand Tutoring Mentoring Program has been successful since it was created in the mid-1990s because of the hundreds of volunteers, lawyers and non-lawyers alike, who have given of their time and energy to help improve the quality of life of our most vulnerable children while supplying them with a temporary safe haven, dignity, and hope. It is they who have my indelible respect and gratitude, and it is on their behalf I accept this wonderful accolade today. Justice Stevens, thank you for your immeasurable public service and for your attendance here today in justice. I really think this is the year your beloved Cubs do it. Savor the moment. Thank you all. Thomas Anthony Durkin is a former assistant United States attorney, and he has had a stellar career as a criminal defense lawyer here in Chicago. But so much attention that has been uh, paid to, to Tom Durkin over the past decade or decade and a half has been through his efforts related to terrorism, both international terrorism and domestic terrorism. And I think it's safe to say that so much of this work has been truly pro bono on his part, uh, a truly deserving recipient of the John Paul Stevens Award, Tom Durkin. Be even mentioned in the same breath as John Paul Stevens, just much less receive an award in his honor is beyond my wildest expectations and I'm tremendously honored and, and flattered to receive this award. And I thank the Chicago Bar Association and the Chicago Bar Foundation. Uh, the greatest satisfaction of my legal career has been our firm's representation of unpopular defendants and the very positive reception I've received for doing that from both the bench and the bar. Um, and, and it makes me proud to be a lawyer. I've always been proud to be a lawyer. Um, but after nine trips to Guantanamo, um, I'm very concerned that the principles of the Chicago Bar Foundation and the principles of the Stevens Award remain utmost in, in, in the minds of all lawyers because we are in, in very difficult times. Um, and I would only read from Justice uh, Stevens' opinion in Rumsfeld versus Padilla back in June of 2004 where he warned that 
unconstrained executive detention for the purpose of investigating and preventing subversive activity is the hallmark of the Star Chamber. Access to counsel for the purpose of protecting the citizen from official mistakes and mistreatment is the hallmark of due process. For if this nation is to remain true to the ideal symbolized by its flag, it must not wield the tools of tyrants even to resist an assault by the forces of tyranny. I'm delighted to be here, delighted to be in the same room with Justice Stevens, and I thank you again. And now, this was my idea, so if this doesn't work, it's my fault. Can I ask these first four recipients to please stand up, come up here, we're gonna hand you your award, and then we'll do a group photograph with Justice Stevens. Our next recipient is uh, J. Timothy Eaton. Tim Eaton is a, uh, is a partner at the Taft firm here in Chicago, and he is, I think, widely recognized as one of the top appellate lawyers in our state. Uh, Tim has been the president of the Appellate Lawyers Association, president of the Illinois State Bar Association, and most recently president of the Chicago Bar Association. I consider Tim Eaton to be a very good personal friend and truly an, a deserving recipient of this award. Tim Eaton. Good afternoon. Someone once said that gratitude is one of the least articulate emotions, especially when deep, deeply felt. Perhaps that is why I'm finding it so difficult to express my sincere appreciation for this award. I am grateful because I am receiving this award from a justice of the Supreme Court that I have long admired. I am grateful because I am receiving this award from two organizations that I cherish so much the Chicago Bar Association and the Chicago Bar Foundation. I'm grateful that I was nominated by a lawyer who's known me since I was five years old and still nominated me and supported by lawyers and judges who I hold in the highest esteem, many of whom are here today. I'm grateful because I'm receiving this award with a group of honorees that have contributed so much to our profession. I'm also grateful to my family, Jane and my children, who have allowed me the opportunity to spend so many hours away from home so I could pursue these professional activities which have both enriched my life and my practice. And finally, I am grateful and humbled to be even in the same program with the past honorees of this award. And if I can single out just one of the original awardees, Judge Bill Bauer. In my opinion, Judge Bauer epitomizes what this award is about. He, like Justice Stevens, has had a long judicial career. He, like Justice Stevens, is known for his civility and respect to all lawyers who appear before him. And he, like Justice Stevens, has given so much to our profession. And by the way, happy 90th birthday, Judge Bauer, someone who I consider both a friend and mentor. Thank you. Uh, Josie Gaw has spent most of her career serving both private and public sector clients. She's currently the Director of Experiential Learning at Loyola Law School here in Chicago. She's received countless awards for her years of service in the areas of diversity, inclusion, and legal education. A true deserving recipient, Josie Gaw. Good afternoon. I'm honored to be with you today and to first thank the Chicago Bar Association and Chicago Bar Foundation. I am grateful beyond words. I never thought I'd be in a position to be in the room with Justice Paul Stevens, but now I have the opportunity to thank him and our fellow honorees for their many, many contributions to this legal profession. I need to say to all of you so that you know the depth of my gratitude, how I think I got here today, because I feel very, very blessed. I need to acknowledge the three families that brought me here. First, my biological family. They have predeceased me, but it was because of them and their sacrifice and their nurturing and their love and their reminding me all the time that education would be the key brought me to this place today. My second family is my adopted family, Loyola University Chicago. Not only did they provide me with a stellar education, 
but they taught me the value of service. Thirdly, it's all of you, so many of you in this room who've contributed to any success that I have had. You have guided me, you've advised me, you have loved me, and you have supported me day in, day out. I will cherish this moment for the rest of my life. Thank you. Uh, Joan Hall was the first female litigation partner at Jenner and Block. She was the first woman to chair the hiring committee at German Jenner and Block. She was the first woman on the firm's executive committee. She was the first Illinois woman to be inducted into the American College of Trial Lawyers. And she was the first woman to chair the American Bar Association's section of litigation. That says an awful lot. But one thing that's not said is that she had a long and wonderful marriage to someone who I consider one of the finest gentlemen that I've ever known, our 2002 award recipient, Stevens Award recipient, George Katsarillos. Joan Hall. There are many reasons that I have so much admiration and respect for Justice John Paul Stevens. Here are just three of those reasons. First, after he completed his Supreme Court clerkship, he had the great good sense to join the Chicago law firm now known as Jenner and Block. But unfortunately, after he was docked a day's pay for taking a day off to travel to Springfield to be sworn into the bar, he shortened his stay at our firm. That bureaucratic blunder was certainly very short-sighted. The second reason for my great admiration for Justice Stevens is that he served in the Navy in World War II. He enlisted on December 6, 1941, the day before Pearl Harbor was attacked. He served as an intelligence officer in the Pacific from 1942 to 1945. He was awarded a bronze star for his work on a code-breaking team. My late husband, George Katsarillis, also served in the Navy in World War II. And by the way, George received the John Paul Stevens Award in 2002. From living with George, I came to understand that our leaders in World War II returned as men of very strong character and great judgment. And so, Justice Stevens, I thank you for your service to our country in World War II. And finally, I am I have great admiration for Justice Stevens' work on the Supreme Court. He wrote many very important decisions, but one of my favorites is the scathing dissent he wrote in Bush versus Gore, where he said, although we may never know with certainty the identity of the winner of this year's presidential election, the identity of the loser is perfectly clear. It is the nation's confidence in the judge as an impartial guardian of the rule of law. I believe those words by Justice Stevens have even greater resonance today. I'm very honored to receive this award. I would like to thank my law firm, Jenner and Block, for the tremendous support they have given me since I joined the firm in 1965. And I would note parenthetically that the firm has always paid me the same as the men at my level. I am especially grateful to the Chicago Bar Foundation, the Chicago Bar Association, and the former law clerks of Justice Stevens. Thanks so much to all of you. <clears throat> Eileen Letts is the co-managing partner of Green and Letts here in Chicago. She founded the firm 26 years ago. Eileen has tried dozens of cases, but has also devoted an enormous amount of time and energy to giving back to the community through pro bono work, legal education, and general service to those in our community who need it. Eileen Letts. First, I want to thank the Chicago Bar Association and the Chicago Bar Foundation for honoring me with this award. To receive this award with the other honorees is such a privilege and I want to congratulate them as well on receiving this award. To be in the company of the current recipients and other past recipients, such as Judge Ann Williams, Bill Conlon, 
Justice Thomas Kilbride and the late Earl Neal is surreal. But the most important honor is to receive an award named after Justice John Paul Stevens. Justice Stevens is the epitome of what all lawyers strive to be, a person who has dedicated his life to public service, community service, and professionalism. Because of his commitment to the law and the people he has touched through his many years of service, he has caused me to try to be a better lawyer. Justice Stevens personifies all of the best qualities of lawyers and judges. The fact that his many law clerks wanted to honor him with an award in his name speaks volumes. He has encouraged all of us to be better lawyers and better community servants. To read his opinions, his speeches, and to hear him speak inspires all of us to do better, to be better. The fact that I am receiving this honor in his name and in his presence is very meaningful to me. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Joe Stone has had a stellar 57-year legal career. He's been a member of the Chicago Bar Association for 56 years. He was president of this organization 30 years ago, but perhaps he is most well known for the fact that this will be his 54th consecutive year in the CBA's Christmas Spirits production. <laughs> and I can say that I've known <laughs> Mr. Stone longer than anyone else on this day, longer than anybody else in this room, having met him when I was six years old, when I started first grade with his daughter, who's also here with us today. <laughs> Joe Stone. Good afternoon. Thank you to the Chicago Bar Association and the Chicago Bar Foundation for sponsoring these luncheons. And a special thank you to the Stevens Selection Committee for selecting me to receive this prestigious honor. I'm proud to add my name to that list of distinguished honorees who have served in that capacity in the past. I don't think I'm anything special, but I know that being a lawyer is special. Lawyers not only have a responsibility to serve their clients professionally and competently, but also a responsibility, if not a duty, to serve their community. I've always been involved in a variety of activities, organizations that serve the public, and have enjoyed that experience and found it to be richly rewarding. Interacting with other folks who are similarly inclined has proven to be a terrific experience, and I would certainly commend it to all. Uh, we lawyers are a proud profession. We've been, been doing good things for a very long time. I suspect that if you looked at the makeup of the boards of directors of any organization that provides charitable, educational, or other services, you would find those boards of directors populated by lawyers. Going back in our history, you might find it instructive to learn that of the 55 delegates to that first constitutional convention in 1787, 33 were lawyers. We've been doing it ever since, and I'm proud to say that we continue to do that to this day. Again, thank you for this wonderful award. It's one that I will cherish and remember for many years to come. And now can I ask these last five recipients to please step up here and, and uh, stand behind Justice Stevens and, uh, and we'll have a group, fi group photo. Okay, folks, um, you know, being president of this organization carries with it many great honors over the course of the year. But perhaps there is no greater honor than being given the opportunity to introduce Justice John Paul Stevens, at least from my perspective. Justice Stevens was nominated to the United States Supreme Court by President Ford in 1975 and he served on our nation's highest court for nearly 35 years before resigning in 2010. And that's all well known, but as Tom Demetrio mentioned, there is another resignation that was made by John Paul Stevens, which is maybe more, more appropriate for today's purposes. In 1970, 
John Paul Stevens, who is a practicing lawyer, was elected second vice president of this organization. But then, when he was nominated to sit on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, he thought that it would be appropriate that he step down from his position at the CBA. So on June 22, 1972, when president of the Chicago Bar Association, Milt Gray, passed the gavel to a guy who stepped into that vacancy named Phil Corboy, who happens to be my uncle, uh, I have the transcript from that luncheon. And President Milt Gray made this comment. He said, uh, Judge Stevens, you're going to have to stand up for us again. Because if Judge Stevens, about a year and a half ago, had not stepped down to, to sit on the second highest court in the land, he would be stepping up today to become president of the Chicago Bar Association rather than Phil Corboy. So let's hear it one more time for John. And there was an applause. <laughs> and according to the transcript, Judge Stevens responded with only one sentence. You made a good trade, Milt. I'll say no more. <laughs> One more story about Judge Stevens, Justice Stevens, and, uh, and a couple of people have mentioned this, and it's probably very well known, that Justice Stevens has been a lifelong and devoted friend and fan of the Chicago Cubs. Most of us know that it has now been 108 years since the Cubs have won a World Series. When Justice Stevens was born in 1920, it had already been 12 years since they had won a World Series. But he was a devoted fan, and he had an opportunity in 1932 to attend a World Series game at Wrigley Field between the Cubs and the New York Yankees. And in game three of that World Series, in the fifth inning, something happened which has become known as a, maybe one of the most famous moments in baseball history, the shot that Ruth called, when Babe Ruth pointed his bat allegedly pointed his bat towards the center field bleachers, and then on the next pitch, hit a home run. Well, Justice Stevens has a chambers in Washington, D.C., which according to Tom DiBitrio, is filled not with all sorts of, of, of memorabilia from other Supreme Court justices or from world leaders, but it's all Chicago Cubs. <laughs> and one thing that Justice Stevens has in his chambers is the scorecard from that game in the 1932 World Series. With that in mind, we've been fortunate enough to have Mike Lafrano join us today. Mike, if you could step up here. Mike is the Executive Vice President and Chief Legal Officer of the Chicago Cubs. And with that 1932 World Series memory as a topic, I want to hand over to Mike Lafrano and he's going to present Justice Stevens with something. Thank you. Thank you. Another story I've heard today, and it's an honor to be here, uh, from a few years ago uh, when Justice Stevens did us the honor of coming to Wrigley Field to throw out a ceremonial first pitch. Uh, now, we've heard about the stories in your chambers and all the pictures uh, of the Cubs and other memorabilia from Wrigley Field. Um, I can tell you what's in my office, uh, which is a picture from that day uh, when Justice Stevens did me the honor of standing on home plate, uh, taking a picture with me, and as I listen to all the ideals that are espoused today, uh, that picture sits in a prominent place in my office and makes me want to be a better lawyer. So for that, I personally thank you. Uh, I can also tell you the pitch was a strike. Uh, and he was wearing a Cubs jersey in that picture. So we thought, what could we do today that would make an appropriate presentation that would look good in his chambers, but that wouldn't be a jersey which he already has, and I hope still fits, um, so we looked for a piece of Wrigley Field history, uh, and that's what we have here today, and the honor uh, is mine, and hopefully you'll join me, um, to present to Justice Stevens a bit of Wrigley Field history. Many of you know that there are flags that fly over the stadium that commemorate great accomplishments uh, in Cubs history. Uh, we hope to add another one this year, and thankfully this is made of wood I can knock. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we took one down, uh, and we'd like to present it to you today. It is a flag that has flown over Wrigley Field to commemorate the 1932 season. Uh, it bears the number 1932, uh, and we'd like to give it to you today.
Thank you very much, Mike. That was, that, that was neat, and I think it was perfectly appropriate. Um, so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming his honor, the Honorable John Paul Stevens. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I should begin by, well, I'm, I gotta thank an awful lot of people. <laughs> That's right. uh, I should begin by saying that uh, the reference to the Chicago Cubs uh, passes by the, one of the most disappointing days in my life. <laughs> they have not mentioned the fact that the Cubs were in the World Series in 1929. And in 1929, my dad took me to the opening game of the series, and the Cubs were heavily favored. But Connie Mack put in a pitcher who was a has-been, a relief pitcher, who struck out 13 Cubs. And that was the saddest day of a young man's life. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to say that I'm certainly uh, honored and pleased to be present at such a nice occasion today. The, I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to congratulate all those who, who won awards today. And I want to say it's a very, uh, very nostal nostalgical occasion, as the president of the Illinois Bar said on one occasion, <laughs> meaning nos nostalgic. <laughs> but uh, I thought that uh, I might uh, uh, read a few paragraphs from the talk I gave at the first of the dinners of the John Paul Stevens Award, because I happened to read through this talk the other day and I thought it was a pretty good talk. <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 you might, might forgive me if I, I just borrow from what I said in the past. I was talking about the Miranda case, which case which I'm sure you are very familiar with, and I'll just take it read a, a few paragraphs and just read them to you. In 1952, I was appointed to represent an Illinois prisoner named Arthur Laframa, who had been convicted of murdering a theater cashier in 1937 on the basis of a confession that he had, he alleged had been extorted from him by brutal methods. Then I have a few paragraphs describing the procedural history of the case. I said, my first concern, of course, was whether the story that my new client had set, set forth in his pleading was true. He had alleged that he was, I don't need these here. He, he, he had alleged that he was um, arrested without a warrant at 5.30 in the morning on December 30, 1937, by two officers who took him to a police station on the pretext of having him identify as supposed suicide. He was then held in various police stations for 11 days and denied the right to see friends, relatives, counsel, or, or anyone else until after January 11, when he was arraigned on a charge of murder. During those 11 days, he was fed only bologna sandwiches, got little, if any, rest, lost 20 pounds, and was subjected to intense questioning. His most serious allegation, however, concerned the events immediately preceding the confession that he had made on the 3rd and 4th of January, a week before he was delivered to the county jail. He alleged that while his hands were handcuffed behind his back, a rope tied to the cuffs was thrown over the top of a door and used to hoist him off the floor. A police captain then allegedly beat him with his fists and a nightstick until he, alleged, until he agreed to confess. Although his allegations were, of course, extremely silly, serious, my primary concern when I first read his pleadings was with the credibility of his charge of actual brutality. It will not surprise you that the most vivid memory of the case is my first interview 
that in uh, Statesville, where he convinced me that his account was entirely accurate. I then described why he convinced me, and I'll, I'll skip over that. When I returned to the office, I discussed my impression of LaFana with my partner, Ed Rothschild, uh, who, and we agreed that it would be appropriate for two-thirds of the manpower of the firm of Rothschild, Stevens, and Berry to cooperate in the preparation for the evidentiary hearing. Our investigation led to the discovery of two documents that strongly corroborated LaFrana's central allegation, a photograph and a medical record. After they obtained the confession, the police held a confer press conference to announce that the murder had been solved. Although LaFrana apparently was on display for only a few minutes, a photographer for the Chicago Herald American was able to hit, take a picture of him. I don't, I, I don't believe the picture was ever published, but it was preserved in an old file even after the paper went out of business and was produced in response to our subpoena. It would clearly showed that LaFrana's face was swollen, badly discolored, and cut in two places. The second document was the record made by the doctor who examined LaFrana when he was admitted to the county jail. Although, although over a week had elapsed since his beating, beating, bruises on his face and body were still evident. More significantly, there were marks on his wrists that, according to the doctor's testimony, were consistent with LaFrana's description of the beating and could not have been caused by even the prolonged handcuffing that he endured while he was in police custody. The testimony that I remember most vividly was given by the police captain who had administered the beating, a man who must have outweighed Lafrano by at least 60 or 70 pounds. I think it might have been even more, actually. Based on my appraisal of the captain's demeanor during cross-examination, a combination of arrogance, obliviousness to inconsistencies, inconsistencies in an inherently improbable tale, and a total lack of concern about the suggestion that there was anything improper about holding a suspect incommunicado for almost two weeks. I was confident that the trial judge would give no credence to his testimony. How wrong I was. At the conclusion of the hearing, without detailing his reasoning, the judge simply ruled that we had failed to meet our burden of proof. And, 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 uh, in retrospect, I have often thought that he must have given great weight to an unstated but powerful presumption that a police officer is a more reliable witness than a person held to answer for a capital or infamous crime. Such a presumption may have special force when the prior effect is a judge who must stand for re-election periodically. Our disappointment at the uh, well, it's, nevertheless, I, going on a bit, I explained that we did appeal and the Supreme Court did reverse unanimously and then uh, Lafrana, uh, the only evidence against Lafrana was his confession and what was held to be inadmissible, the state had no evidence to support the 17-year-old murder charge. He was therefore released and the charge was dismissed. Then I say a little more about the Miranda case, and I ended with a comment that because those of you who know that I am addicted to footnotes in my opinions, <laughs> I added this uh, footnote at the end to end my comment. So the fact is not necessarily relevant to the legal issue. I am convinced that the benefits of the Miranda decision have been enjoyed not only by countless individual citizens, but also by law enforcement officers. The fact that the Keystone cops of the 1930s have been replaced by trained and respected professionals is at least in part attributable to that decision. Now that's all I want to read from the speech, but I, I did also want to mention that I have the, the list of the people who received the the uh, John Paul Stevens Award on that occasion. 
and they, they included uh, Gene Allard first, and secondly, the Honorable William J. Bauer, United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, who, who's a man whom I'm happy to say we're gonna celebrate his birthday very shortly. I should say he's, re he's reached a very, di very distinguished age, but he's still a kid to me. <laughs> and then also on the program were Phil, Phil Corboy, Milton Gray, uh, the, uh, G uh, George N. Layton, the retired U U.S. District Judge, Don Clark Netch, Jerry Salvi, and Thomas Sullivan, a partner at uh, Jenner and Block, who I think is here today. And, and, I, uh, and, have, and I wanted to say uh, uh, just, just one other thing, and that is that I, I congratulate all the people who have won awards today, and I thank all of you for attending attending this event and continue to show your interest in the, in the uh, uh, pub public benefits of the Chicago Bar Association. Thank you very much for coming. Folks, just uh, some final remarks this afternoon are going to be from Judge Bill Bauer, who, as everybody knows, DuPage County State's Attorney, Circuit Court Judge in DuPage County, U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Illinois, District Court Judge, Northern District of Illinois, and for 42 years now, a judge on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. But for our purposes today, and perhaps more importantly, Judge Bauer is a lifelong friend and former colleague of John Paul Stevens. Please share some words with us, Judge. This is what's called a tail end, so it's not very soon. In the interest of uh, letting you all know my interest in this thing, I was, as they said, the first one of the first recipients of this award. I had also the distinct pleasure of having served with John Paul Stevens, and I am the last survivor of that group on the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. We were comrades, we were co-workers in that lovely field for those years, and we have maintained our deep friendship ever since. But I thought you ought to find out, why, if you know, also, in the interest of disclaiming, you look at the front, on the list inside the committee award things includes me. Uh, so I thought you'd like to know how we select and what we have. We talk about public service, integrity, and the contributions, not just to the profession, but to the community at large. And that's true. And there are many, many people, as we can tell, because we get many, many applications that meet that standard. There's one I left out that we consider very carefully. One of the kindest men I ever met in my life was John Paul Stevenson is. He's decent to everybody. In the most difficult times on the bench, he remained courteous, calm, and in charge of his own emotions. Even on things he felt deeply about, he avoided cutting remarks about anybody else. We take into consideration those applicants or those people nominated for this who meet that standard of civility as well. It turned, it seems to me, and it has seemed all my professional life, that being a lawyer and being a judge is so important and so nice that the least you can do is be nice to other people. And he is and has been nice to other people all his life. And that I thank him for, and I use that as a hallmark for all of us. And I hope we all pay attention to it. Otherwise than that, I'm glad to be here with my friend, my many of many, many years, my colleague, and my beau ideal, John Paul Stevens. Thank you. Okay, folks, you're almost out of here. 
As, as you've heard several times now, Judge Bauer turns 90 years old tomorrow. And um, I think it's safe to say that along with John Paul Stevens, there is no greater friend to the Chicago Bar Association than Judge Bauer. And so please, somebody take the lead and let's sing happy birthday for Judge Bauer on the eve of his 90th birthday. To you, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Judge Bauer. Happy birthday.